What's up everybody? This is Rusty with Beach and Barn. Today I'm going to show you how to use a Weber kettle grill to smoke uh, pulled pork, pulled barbecue, Boston butt, smoke butt, smoke barbecue, whatever you call it. Let's get started. Before you do anything, uh, you're going to want to soak your hickory chips in water, which will create a nice smoke and let those burn slower. So I'm starting here with a eight pound Boston butt. You can just go to your local butcher and ask him for a Boston butt. Just know it's gonna take about an hour per pound to cook. A Boston butt is always going to have about a half inch to maybe three quarter inch fat cap on top of it. The fat cap on this particular one is very small. I know this is controversial, but I always trim the fat cap off in as close to one piece as I can, and then I set that fat cap on top of the meat before the cook. And that's going to allow me to just take easily take off any of the fat that doesn't render into a liquid during the cook. So this video isn't as much about spice profiles and all that kind of stuff. It's more about uh, good cooking fundamentals. So I just use a Traeger pork and poultry rub. It's really good. Just rub that dry all over your pork and focus on good smoking technique. Before we get too far into uh, the grill setup and the equipment setup, I want to point out uh, that you can click this link right here which is going to take you to a printable PDF that you can print as kind of a cheat sheet to keep with you for your first smoke. Uh, it'll kind of remind you all the things that you need to keep in mind so you don't have to keep going back and forth to your phone or your computer. So a traditional kettle grill is not really meant to be used for smoking. It's meant to apply radiant direct heat uh, onto hamburgers, hot dogs, and things like that. But by taking your kettle grill and creating a cool side and a hot side between this imaginary red line I've got, we can put the food on the cool side, the fire on the hot side, and let that air enter the cool side, go up through the fire, and exit through the top vent over the cool side. So how I'm going to do that is by foiling uh, the bottom grate of my kettle grill. This is where the charcoal usually sits. I'm going to use charcoal baskets to contain my fire. So if you see what I'm doing here, I'm dividing that into about two-thirds sections. So I'm making sure that I leave about an inch of space for the fire to come up through that grate. So it's really important that when you reinstall this bottom grate that you leave the open unfoiled side on the hot side of the grill because that's where your charcoal basket's going to go and it needs to be directly opposite of the adjustment vent on the bottom of the grill. And the key to creating the hot side and the cool side is by using fire brick. You don't use traditional brick, uh, they'll blow up. You gotta use fire brick, which you can get from any brick supplier. After that, I'm gonna set my drip pan in that I was using to soak my wood chips, and that's gonna catch all the fat that comes off of my piece of meat on the cool side. So to finish off setting up the hot side and cool side, I'm gonna put two more fire brick directly above the two fire brick that are on the lower grate. Next thing we have to do is fill our charcoal basket about halfway up with charcoal. Some people like lumps, some people like briquettes. I like lumps, I just think it burns longer. And again, I'm only gonna fill up about one side, one half of that charcoal basket. You can use any method you want to get that fire going. I prefer using a uh, charcoal chimney. I just turn it upside down because I don't really need that much charcoal to get it going. Another little tip I'd use is to cut the top of my charcoal bag out as I'm going down, and then I use that in my charcoal chimney. It's a uh, windy day outside, so I'm just gonna use a portable propane torch to uh, get that fire going. And I'm just gonna set that charcoal chimney on my top grate while uh, everything is burning nice and white. Once I've got some good coals going, I'm gonna go ahead and dump those into that empty half of my charcoal basket. And I kinda of let that conclude the setup of my equipment. Okay. 
So what signifies the end of the setup and the beginning of the cook to me is when I place the meat uh, fat cap side up on the cool side grate. Next thing I'm gonna do is start to put those wet wood hickory wood chips on top of my hot burning coal. So one of my goals during this eight hour cook is to open the lid as few times as possible. One of the only reasons I need to open the lid is to add more fuel so I really load it up when I've got it open and have the chance. I don't worry about the radiant heat hitting my meat because those bricks are going to stop it. So the goal of the cook is to maintain that low slow 225 degree temperature and keep it consistent throughout the cook by closing off the two vents on the hot side and doing your adjustment by the one vent on the cool side. Now there is an art to manually maintaining that temperature inside the grill. So as you can see by the video here, I have a temperature regulator hooked up to my cool side adjustment vent. That regulator is nothing more than a fan that reads the internal temperature of the grill and gives it air when needed. The next thing I have to do is set the probe for my temperature regulator or my uh, electronic thermometer uh, as close to the meat as possible so I can keep a good eye on what the heat is like inside that grill. Uh, the goal is to maintain 225 degrees until the internal temperature of that meat is just over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So when you see your grill's temperature start to dip below 225 degrees, it's time to do a fuel and temperature check. You should only do these about every hour and a half to two hours. The first thing you're gonna do is check the internal temperature of the meat. I'm only at 92 degrees here. Yeah, make sure you don't touch the bone with your thermometer, but I'm only between 92 and 98 degrees. Second thing I'm gonna do every time I open that lid is shake my coal, my charcoal basket and create plenty of airways and get all that ash to kind of fall down into the bottom of the grill. Then I'm gonna add wood chips, more charcoal, and the reason I like to put those uh, wet wood chips between the coal that's already burning really hot down in the bottom of that basket and the fuel uh, or charcoal that I'm putting on there now is I think it puts a little bit of a barrier, creates a lot of smoke and um, keeps that new fuel from getting too hot too fast. And if you want, you can kind of spritz your uh, meat with vinegar. Um, usually I use like a spray bottle to spray the vinegar uh, on there, but this time I'm just kind of pouring it directly over top of it. If you skip that step, meat's still going to turn out just fine. Put the lid back on, leave it for a couple of hours. So about the time your meat reaches an internal temperature of about 160, 165 degrees, you're going to experience what's known as the stall. And really what that means is at about 160 degrees, the meat starts to sweat. And just like our sweat cools us off, that's gonna cool the meat off as well. And it makes it really tough for you to go on up to 170, 80 degrees, uh, all that uh, sweat. So uh, what I like to do is uh, cover the meat in foil, kind of pack it tightly in a couple layers of foil. Uh, some guys don't do this. They just add more fuel, grab another beer, and power through that stall. Uh, eventually, the meat will come out of it. will sweat all that it can, and uh, it will come out of the stall. But I like to speed things up a little bit by wrapping it in the tin foil, and it kind of creates a little blanket almost and, and makes the meat cook itself. It's going to make the bark of your barbecue just a little softer, but... Uh, I promise you're not gonna have any complaints. While I've got the grill open, I'm not sure that it's taken on a whole lot more smoke flavor from those wood chips, but I'm gonna go ahead and dump all my wood chips in there, load it up with fuel, and that should be the last time that I have to do a fuel load. Another thing I tend to do, uh, depending on how much time I have and how hungry I am, is while it's in the stall and wrapped in foil, I'll just go ahead and turn that temperature up to about 250. So 
So after I've had the meat wrapped for about an hour and a half, two hours, I'm gonna go ahead and check the temperature again. And I should be getting very close to about 200 degrees, a little over 200 degrees. And uh, you can kind of visually check and see if your fat cap is starting to melt a little bit. Uh, but if your internal temperature's over 200 and that fat cap's starting to melt, go ahead and pull that thing off of uh, the grill and get it into a cooler. While the meat is in the cooler, and I leave it for about an hour, hour and a half, it's still cooking. Uh, it's also just giving it, uh, the meat, a chance to kind of reabsorb those juices that are trapped into that tin foil. So you're going to go ahead and put your meat into your chopping pan and get it out of that tin foil. Now ideally the bone should slip right out of your meat. I finished this a uh, little early so I had to dramatize that bone coming out of the meat a little bit. So use your pork claws, I'll leave a uh, link to mine uh, below, to pull apart all of the meat and you really want to mix that pink smoky stuff with your less smoky meat from the middle. Then I'm just going to add a little more seasoning and a little more vinegar afterwards and make sure this stuff is all mixed up really well. Keep grinding that meat until you get it really fine and really well pulled apart. You don't want huge, huge chunks of uh, smoked pork in your sandwich when you eat it. So here's what that good uh, chopped and pulled uh, mixed pork is going to look like when you're done. Lots of that smoky stuff from the outside mixed up with the stuff from the middle. I also want to take a quick second to acknowledge my buddy uh, Matthew Register with Southern Smoke Barbecue in Garland, North Carolina. He is the author of Southern Smoke and has been a great resource to me as I've tried to figure out how to do as much smoking as possible on my Weber cattle. And I'm going to leave a link to his book right here.